awesome looking restaurant. Here I am, this is 1919, and I'm gonna go sit inside, play around with some really, really cool gadgets. Plus, later on at the end of the show, how you can win yourself a brand new Samsung Series 5 Ultrabook. Details coming up, let's head inside. You know, I used to be on radio and I got exposed to a lot of music but sometimes I just can't share it because, well, my smartphone, the speakers aren't exactly the greatest. However, I might have a solution in the form of this little bad boy or bad girl. Let's find out a little bit more in first look. Look at this little bad boy right here. This is the Logitech Boombox, and it's pretty nifty if you ask me. Now, like I mentioned, nowadays, everybody wants to play their music no matter where they are. Supposing you go to a friend's house and you want to play some tunes, but maybe the speakers there aren't so great because it's on your phone. Well, this is a device that comes into play, and it's pretty nifty. In fact, it reminds me of Wally, -E, you know, the... <laughs> character from uh, Pixar and it's got a very Wally vibe about it and just look at the color scheme itself. Okay, so apart from that, it's a pretty nifty little device as you can see and the most important thing about this, for me anyway, is the weight. It's only eight ounces so it's not going to weigh things down if you're going to go overseas, if you're going to be putting it in your bag, supposing maybe you're carrying a rucksack or a ladies bag, I don't know what to call it, a ladies bag, this is not going to weigh things down so that's obviously very very useful in my opinion. Now, as for the actual device, underneath this cover screen here, well, there's two speakers there, there's two drivers there, so it kind of almost gives off the impression of stereo sound, but it's not quite stereo sound. However, it does a very, very nifty job. Let me explain a little bit more. Now, firstly, it all operates by pairing via Bluetooth. Now, you can probably tell by the icon here for the phone calls, it's got the Bluetooth icon. So it's pretty seamless, pretty easy to use. Uh, there is also an auxiliary cable right there, so you can actually plug it in via that as well. Now, in case you're wondering, what we have here on the front is not just for show, this actually works and it can control everything. For example, I paired it with an iPhone, press play. You can hear everything coming out. Now, this is not just for show and tell either. I mean, what you can see right there, if something comes through in terms of a phone call, it will change to your phone's caller ringtone. Let's hope I don't get a phone call right now because I'm talking. And you can start to answer via this device as well. It's pretty cool. I mean, it does look very sleek with the red light on the black background. And I'm a big fan of that, the sleekness of the entire device. Um, in terms of other aspects though, when you're plugging it into charge, this will pop up. It will turn on irrespective of whether the actual device is on off. So that's a little bit frustrating. Um, although this is the only indicator for when the actual device is on or off. However, uh, in terms of every old, the other buttons, you can see right here, pretty simple. USB, now this charges via USB as well. There's a simple on and off switch and the auxiliary cable, which I already pointed out before. It all makes for a very handy, compact and easy to navigate device. Now for the most important part, apart from the actual weight of the device, would be the performance of the device. Now, I'll be honest, I mean, it's something this small. When I'm playing some music, you can feel it vibrating in your hand, you can feel the power emanating from it. However, the moment I switch my iPhone to the maximum volume and this on the maximum volume, that's when things start to distort, which of course is the boon of all devices which are this small. So if you're gonna blast it really loud, 
don't expect much of a performance. However, at moderate levels, it's pretty decent if you ask me. I mean, it's gonna definitely entertain a crowd if you're at a table this size or maybe double this. So it's gonna do the job done in that aspect. Now, in terms of how long it actually lasts for, Mm, full charge, they say, gives you 10 hours. However, if you're gonna blast it at the top volume, which I wouldn't advise because of the distortion, you're gonna get less than that, and obviously, uh, full 10 hours maximum, and then uh, you just have to scale it accordingly, effectively. Another aspect of performance I haven't mentioned is the microphone here. So when I do answer a call, which is the bot button right there, they will automatically be picked up via the mic, and it sounds actually pretty clear if you ask me. It's doing a pretty, pretty nifty job in that aspect. Overall, as long as you're not maxing out the performance, it's actually pretty good to go. So what are my closing thoughts about this? It's a very, very nice device. I haven't mentioned the price, 299 ringgit, so it's definitely a steal. It's very, very competitively priced. And for something that much, you're getting a very, very excellent device in terms of performance. I mean, some of the cons would be the bass isn't really there, uh, distortion at higher volumes, but that can be kind of expected from a device like this. And let's be honest, five years ago, the ability of this in terms of output you would have been unheard of. So it's obviously it's come leaps and bounds and it's also a great, great price. Uh, overall, I think it's a very cool device. It's light, it's portable, and of course, you're getting three things in one, technically, or a couple of things in one. You get wireless audio, you're getting a portable boom box, and of course, you're getting something for your mobile phone as an accessory. So all in all, a great little device. Very cool. Let's be honest, if you want to stay successful in any field, you cannot stay static. You have to be constantly evolving to become a real game changer. Now that's certainly what Toshiba have done. They've evolved and gone back to the drawing board with their new tablet. The question is, is it actually a game changer? So it's tablet time, Toshiba Regza 8200. Quite a nifty little tablet. Now you're wondering what's next to it. It is a new iPad. This is just for comparison in terms of shape and size. Quite similar looking, although this has got more, the Toshiba one rather, has got more rounded edges as you can see right there. And its dimensions are slightly different. Now firstly, I have to point out one thing. It's the difference in weight. So at first it feels like it's about the same, but after prolonged use, say 10 minutes afterwards, you'll start to notice a difference. Now this is slightly over 100 grams heavier than the Toshiba. So the longer you use your tablet, especially with one hand, the more heavy it is going to feel if you're using the new iPad. So that is already a huge plus point in the favor of the Toshiba tablet that we have right here. Now, there is a slight downside to that. It just feels slightly more plasticky than the actual new iPad. From everything around the side here and the buttons, which I'm gonna show you, well, you can kind of see at the side, right? There. So you get my general drift. You can get a very much lighter weight, but the parts just don't feel quite as sturdy is the word I'm looking for. So what about the actual performance details about this? Well, let's just focus on what's on the outside. Now, I mentioned that it feels a bit plasticky, although I forgot to mention that it's metallic on the back, and that does feel steady. Now, on the side, however, along the sides here, there's quite a few different uh, sockets. Well, firstly, this is just the volume and the power. The main focus is on this side of the tablet right here. So, in case you're wondering, this does have two variations, 16 GB and 32 GB, although, with this micro SD card slot here, you can boost it up all the way to 32 GB per micro SD. So already there's quite a heavy focus 
on a media on this. If you're going on a long distance journey somewhere, be it a car and you're gonna be staying somewhere on a plane, it's great to be able to transport a whole bunch of media files via this if there's not enough space on the tablet itself. Uh, it's got the HDMI output there, it's got USB there, and of course uh, there is a, an actual charge source right there. You can plug in your USB and start charging away on the device. Now as for the actual specs in this, underneath all of this, talking a 1.2 uh, gigahertz processor, it's running Honeycomb 3.2, but I hear it will be upgradable to ice cream sandwich all in good time. Now, how about everything else? As for the actual screen, you're talking 10.1. Uh, that's the screen size. It's pretty good in terms of power. It's comparable, say, to the Galaxy Tab 10.1 and the Acer Iconia Tab as well. So it's great. It's also very responsive when you're touching it, when you want to browse the web and so forth. It's very well coated. It's got the grid glass here, so it feels very, very sturdy as well. Great job there, I have to say, from Toshiba. Now, another key aspect which I haven't touched upon is the sound. It's got stereo sound, and because it's uh, along the edges, when you're resting it on a flat surface, it doesn't actually affect the sound quality. I can't really test it because it's not going to come across for you on the TV, but let's just say that not many tablets out there do actually have stereo sound, so that's definitely a huge plus. In terms of how that actually sounds though, it's pretty cool. You can actually download some third-party apps and then you can tweak the sound accordingly to make sure that it is given the best quality possible in your opinion, of course. It's a pretty sturdy, it's a pretty solid performance from Toshiba and it's a nice little offering in the tablet market itself. I mean, I haven't even talked about the camera, but just so you know, this is not your standard VGA one on the front. We're talking two megapixels, so quite decent for some self-portrait, but nothing outstanding. And on the back, you're talking five megapixels as well. But again, like most tablets, you just lack the color of the real world and um, pictures for me are never sold on tablets. I'm still not used to it, to be honest. Uh, elsewhere, well, Honeycomb, it's pretty sturdy as well, it has to be said. I mean, ice cream sandwich, I'm sure it's going to be awesome on this as well, but Honeycomb for now will do. Uh, another point I have to add is there is no 3G model. So if you're used to being able, or if you have a tablet that is, if you're used to the 3G connection, you'll have to get used to just Wi-Fi, although who knows in the future maybe a 3G model will come out. But apart from that, it's all pretty nifty if you ask me. It feels great in the hand, although having it flat at the back, even though it is metallic, ergonomically speaking, it's not the greatest. I still prefer a curved feeling to it. And elsewhere, it's a bit plasticky in my opinion, but that's what you get if you want to have a lighter tablet, which it certainly is. Perhaps a solid 3.5 out of 5. We've been analyzing mobile malware and attacks on smartphones for several years already. But the situation is that it's right now much less risky using your smartphones than using your computers. We see much more attacks on Windows computers than on any of the smartphone platforms. However, we are already seeing the first examples of problems. We have privacy issues where smartphones collect too much information about us. And we also have security problems like Android malware. And Android is especially the one which is being targeted by more and more malware and backdoor and Trojans. So people have to start thinking about security on their smartphones as well. Well, the first thing is to make sure you have backups. And that's the one thing I always tell people. Make sure you have backups. And that applies to your computer and to your smartphone. And it's especially easy to see why do you need a backup on your phone, because you can just lose it or somebody might steal it, might drop it into a lake. And then if you don't have a backup, you have a problem. So you start from backup, then you start thinking about other things like uh, remote locate in case you can't find your phone or remote lock, remote wipe, uh, online filtering, especially if you have children and you give a smartphone to a kid, you want to make sure they can't just surf to any website. And then also antivirus. And this is especially important on Android where we found several thousand malicious files so far. The majority of the attackers are motivated by money. 
so they want to gain access to people's computers so they can make money out of it. And this means that the attackers go to where the people are, or to them where the victims are. And of course, people are today on social networks. They're on Facebook, they're on Twitter, and, and elsewhere in social media. So criminals have found these places long ago, and they use these mechanisms, for example, stealing people's Facebook accounts. And the way they do it is that they, they have, for example, a keylogger on a computer. So when people log in from that computer, they will lose their Facebook password. Then the attackers will log in with that account and start sending messages, wall posts or direct messages to your friends. And those messages will have links to outside websites which have exploits on them. So when your friends see your messages, think it's a link from you, they click on it and then they get infected. And now they have a keylogger on their computer. And then the criminals can start to use those to steal money, for example, with banking Trojan attacks from those infected computers. So Facebook or Twitter is just the medium through which they can infect your computer and then they can monetize the actual infection. They, they try to find vulnerabilities and, and in, in typical scenario the administrators of the news site ha haven't updated the server software or they must, might, might be what we call an SQL injection problem. So there's a way of in injecting code from the web browser to the server and execute it. And like five years ago if somebody would gain access to a high profile website what they would do is that they would delete everything and change the front page to stupid jokes. But today, it's much more likely that they don't change anything at all. Everything looks normal, but they inject malicious JavaScript onto the page. And then when people come to the site, they get infected. Noah Falstein. Now this chap well, he's a freelance game designer and producer, but check this out. He's been doing this since 1980. In fact, he was one of the first 10 people working at Lucasfilm Games. So, of course, with this wealth of experience and knowledge, we just had to catch up with him in Gamer Station. Hey, Avery Scores here with yet another exciting episode of the Gamer Station, and I'm truly honored to be here with Noah Falstein, industry stalwart, industry veteran, who's now started Suddenly Social. And uh, I'd like to talk to you, Noah. First, how did you get involved in this industry, and how did you explain your meteoric rise? <laughs> well, my meteoric rise over the, the blisteringly short period of 32 years. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, I got into games right out of college uh, just because I loved board games as a kid and learned programming you know back in the late 70s and just started to hear about this new computer game thing and boy I, as soon as I played my first computer game I got hooked and never occurred to me it was a career choice but I kept doing it because I loved it and gradually it turned into a career in an industry uh, just to keep it short. Um, started with companies, uh, I was one of the first few people at Lucasfilm Games that later became LucasArts and that was really uh, what kind of got my career on its on its. Path. I'm so glad you brought that up Noah, we were just talking about this instance ago, uh, this is the man behind insult sword fighting in the Monkey Island games. How did you come up with that brilliant concept? Well, I, thank you very much. It was actually through uh, thievery and duplicity, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, Sid Meier had created a, a game called uh, Pirates, and there, there was a recent re-release of that. And he had this wonderful sword fighting in, inter interface in it. Uh, so a year or so later, I was working on Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade with uh, my friend Ron Gilbert. And uh, we needed a boxing interface because uh, Indy goes, you know, fighting the Nazis all the time. And uh, I thought, oh, that sword fighting in interface, you know, you sort of punch high, medium, and low, um, or you, you stab high, medium, and low, why not turn it into a boxing interface? So we did that. But I neglected to mention where I appropriated that idea. And then Ron came around another year or two later and said, you know, I'm working on this uh, Secret of Monkey Island game and I, I was thinking I might do sword fighting and I thought, you know, your boxing interface you came up with, that would be a great pirate sword fighting interface. <laughs> and he was going on about that. So I said, Ron, you know, I have to confess, you know, I told him where it came from and we realized, oh, if we did that, it would be too obviously a ripoff. So we were musing about it and, and kind of out of desperation, uh, I said, well, you know, it was the, the movie The Princess Bride has a wonderful sword fight scene where at the top of the cliffs, 
And in that movie and in older Douglas Fairbanks, you know, things going way back to the 1930s, they would fight for a while and then the swords would be clenched and they would just talk to each other. And it was totally unrealistic, but it was the fun part of what they would say to each other and the bad guy would sneer at the good guy and the good guy would be stalwart and push back on the whole thing and then they'd go and fight a little while. And with the spirit of Monkey Island, you know, I said, well, what if we made it all about not how good you are at sword fighting, but how good you are at insulting the other player? And that's really how it all came about, you know, and Ron took it and, and ran with the ball and made it into a much better concept. I think that's excellent. I think those games had such character that you were involved in it early on in your career. And so what, what, what happened next for you? Well, I, I moved on. I, I went to a couple big companies. I was uh, early on at uh, 3DO making the very first CD-ROM console and um, was one of the, I was the third employee at DreamWorks Interactive when DreamWorks was starting up. And I, I enjoyed that whole thing. I enjoyed the Hollywood thing with both DreamWorks and Lucasfilm. There was lots of good connection. I, I got to brainstorm with uh, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas on a project and a really wonderful time. But I got tired of having people above me using me like a chess pawn. So I went freelance in 96 and spent uh, another 15 years or so doing that, working on uh, a whole bunch of different projects, both entertainment games and serious games, uh, PC, console, uh, some social media and then mobile gaming. Uh, and then in the last year, finally, uh, got together with a group of uh, friends from LucasArts and we worked together on uh, a game called Habitat that was the very first virtual world back in 86 and uh, started a company called Suddenly Social that I'm with right now. And so speaking of Suddenly Social, something that you said that uh, intrigued me uh, at your talk at this venerable conference was that you don't believe that today's crop of social games are truly social. Could you explain that? Sure. Well, one of the things that comes up is the term social games has been applied uh, primarily to games on Facebook and other big social media. And a lot of those games, number one, they're not really played with other players. They're played with someone's avatar or you give a gift or you, you do something on someone's farm and six hours or six days later someone will log in and say, oh yes, here's his avatar doing that. So it's not really real-time interaction and there's, there's a, a, a coldness to it because of that lack of human interaction. But even more so, uh, you know, not to, to uh, bash Zynga too much because they, they certainly have done some uh, exciting stuff, but a lot of those games, the, the, you, you plant crops and your crops wither and you come back to the game not because you enjoy the game but because you're ashamed of your friends seeing your crops withering <laughs> or you're envious of you know the wonderful stuff you saw at their farm and you want to buy some for your, yourself. There are all these negative emotions uh, associated with it and I really think that to transcend that if, if social games are going to continue to grow and to be really big around the world they need to tap into some of the more positive, cooperative, collaborative feelings and also that immediacy of not just that I'm playing with your avatar, but I'm playing actually with you. And you know, playing with your friends is great, but sometimes it's better to play with a stranger in real time, connecting, helping each other, than your friend as an avatar that you just uh, you know see their controlled uh, computer-controlled avatar on the screen. You don't act, you know your friend's not actually even online at the moment. It just loses that immediacy. I think that's exactly right. I think it ends up becoming like a job. And, exactly. You know, sort of like a, a blitz chess game at a well, distance. Well, and, and I'd also quote uh, Raf Koster, who's a, a brilliant game designer, who really has put his finger on the fact that for millennia, games were all about interacting with another person, maybe over a board or over cards. And it's only been a quirk of the last, you know, 30, 40 years that we've had computers and games have been single player or disconnected, you know, uh, uh, kinds of experiences. So it's time to bring that connection back in. You know, the, the uh, internet and uh, mobile gaming has made it possible for us to always be connected to other people. And that's really where this was all about to begin with. So it's gone full circle that way. Brilliant. No, we're almost out of time, but I'd like you to whet our appetite. What, do you, what does Suddenly Social have in the pipe for us? Well, we've got uh, some real-time multiplayer games where you play uh, with your friends, you know, with instant responses, 
And our company is founded to make that software available to developers all over the world. So hopefully, you know, like Unity and other engines, you'll be able to plug in our software and see it in hundreds or thousands of other people's games because we, we want to spread that gospel of connecting other people and uh, not just keep it to ourselves. Brilliant. Well, you've heard it here first. Noah Falstein, thank you for coming on the thank show. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. How cool does this sound? I have something to give away for the first time in the history of Gadget Nation, and it's an awesome prize. In fact, we have four units of this, the Samsung Series 5 Ultrabook. So let me explain how it works. I'm going to ask two questions a week. Now, this is going to run for a couple of weeks, so in total there will be eight questions that you have to answer. So you have to keep looking out for it every single week, okay? Following that, make sure you complete this slogan. 25 words or less is the space you have to do so. So the two questions for this week are on the screen. Got it? Got it? Okay, cool, excellent. Our email address is gngadget at astro.com.my. Send the answers in. Get ready for next week's questions and of course get your slogan ready. Can't wait to give that away. See you next time.